Thanks to today's returning sponsor, Fabulous, the number one self-care app that can help you build better habits and achieve your goals. A little bit about them later in the video. Don't bother watching any queer shows. They'll just cancel them after a season. All over my corner of the internet, I've been hearing the same frustration. Apparently, everyone's favorite TV shows with LGBTQ plus representation are being taken off the air. This rumbling came to a spectacular head with the announcement that Netflix was canceling First Kill, a show about a teenage vampire and vampire hunter falling in lesbian love. I've been in the media analysis game for a while now, and I'm no stranger to the preemptive cancellation of shows I love. One of my favorite TV series of all time, In the Flesh, only got nine episodes before being axed, so um, I know that pain. Shows have always been canceled. It's the way of TV, right? So is there any truth to these claims that queer shows are being canceled at a dis proportionate rate? Is there some kind of agenda against giving them the chance that they deserve? I don't think anyone can deny that LGBTQ plus focused or inclusive shows have been the victim of cancellations this year. Just to name a few that have been canceled so far in 2022, Q-Force, First Kill, The Wilds, Batwoman, Gentleman Jack, Love Victor, Work in Progress, The Babysitter's Club, DC's Legends of Tomorrow, Charmed, Naomi, Paper Girls, Teenage Bounty Hunters, and Motherland Fort Salem. First, let's break this down by network or streaming platforms to get a closer look at the impact of this and some of the context behind it. Netflix. When the streaming titan laid off 150 employees in May of this year, these lost jobs included most of their diversity-focused publishing channels, including their LGBTQ focused most. At its peak, Netflix interest in diverse stories that didn't feel like they had a home elsewhere, things like Orange is the New Black and Sense8, it was one of their defining factors. Yet more recently, we've seen programming that goes against this ethos, like Dave Chappelle's controversial stand-up special, which led to both audiences and internal staff complaints of transphobia. Netflix's co-CEO, Ted Sarandos, sent out a memo to staff, which made it clear that this wasn't a one-off or exception to the type of content that he was now prioritizing on the platform, saying, if you'd find it hard to support our content breadth, Netflix may not be the best place for you. And with that drop in mind, we get the news of another cancellation. First Kill. Okay, First Kill. It's a supernatural teen vampire drama with all that that suggests. Warring families, forbidden romances, high school drama, and more. This is the cancellation that I have personally seen the most noise about, and I think that's for several reasons. Firstly, it's a rare teen show focused primarily on a sapphic couple, specifically a couple that included a black character. Secondly, it was cancelled very soon after its release, despite seemingly being in the top 10 list on Netflix for most of that time. And thirdly, shows like Heartstop a teen show with a central romance between two white teen boys was renewed around the same time, even though the show seemed to have worse viewing figures than First Kill did. For many commenters online, this seemed to be an indication of something rotten in the works at Netflix, specifically a bias against lesbian and sapphic leads. First Kill hit the weekly top 10 for English language TV series on the platform, peaking at number three behind only Stranger Things and Peaky Blinders new seasons. Seems like an obvious case for a renewal, right? Right? Let's look at the stats on either side to try and figure out what is going on. Although I don't necessarily think that pitting queer shows against each other in a there can only be one battle is helpful in any way, Heartstopper does make a useful comparison for this. So you know, just a quick disclaimer, both of them can exist at the same time. First Kill had more hours of viewing than Heartstopper. That is, if you add up all of the like collective hours that everyone watched the show. Um, a Allegedly, it had just over double what Heartstopper had in both of their first few days. They both ran for a total of eight episodes. However, the length of the episodes were very different. First Kill averaged 49 minute episodes, including two minutes of end credits, compared to Heartstopper's 29 minute episodes with four minutes of end credits. Looking at it this way, Hours Watch seems pretty comparable. The reception to Heartstopper by wider audiences has proven also to be much better than First Kill on the surface. It received a perfect 100% score from the critics on Rotten Tomatoes compared to First Kill's 58%. However, although the critic score might be disappointing, the public score for First Kill is a healthy 89%, much higher than other franchises that got the go ahead for more content, like the Kissing Booth adaptation, which scored only 55% from its audience and a measly 15% from critics, but has spawned multiple sequels. Plus, we know that the critics asterate this series are unlikely to be its core target audience of sapphic teen girls, so there might be a little swaying and bias there. From this, it seems watch hours and critic scores aren't necessarily the be-all and end-all of the renewal decision, so what is? 
Production budget is almost certainly part of the issue. A teen show filmed in an existing high school over the summer holidays with shorter episodes is inevitably going to be cheaper than a supernatural thriller with special effects and fight sequences. But probably the biggest factor was the low completion rate of the series. Showrunner Felicia D. Henderson explained after news of the cancellation broke that the completion rate wasn't high enough. Essentially meaning that although a lot of people started the show, pushing up hours watched, not enough people finished the series to justify another season, where the base viewers would only be a percentage of those that started the first season. After all, why would you watch the second or third season of a show that you tried but didn't like enough to finish the first eight episodes of? Even if Heartstopper had less overall accounts watching, more watched the first season in its entirety. Those that find the show are seemingly likely to enjoy it and are primed as loyal viewers for following seasons as well as word of mouth marketing to bring in additional audiences on top of that as the months go on after its release. So First Kill as an example feels like a messy piece of evidence for some mass scale oppression of queer TV, but let's look at other networks and streamers to see if this potential wave of queer cancellation is more widespread. The CW. The CW is probably known primarily for shows around teens that also have like a supernatural sci-fi or thriller subgenre. Riverdale, The 100, Gossip Girl, they have some pretty iconic series under their belt. They're also a network well known for their LGBTQ plus rep in recent years. According to the GLAAD TV analysis from 2022, they have been the leading broadcast network for LGBTQ plus representation for five successive seasons, with 17% of their season regulars being queer. Great news, right? Except that streak is about to come to a screeching halt, with the cancellation of Batwoman, DC's Legends of Tomorrow, In the Dark, Roswell, New Mexico, Dynasty, Naomi, Legacies, Charmed and more. These shows all featured one or more central queer characters. The Charmed remake, for example, had made two of its three leading witches queer, and The Legends of Tomorrow featured five queer series regulars. The only remaining LGBTQ plus lead show, Tom Swift, has now also been cancelled. According to journalist Anna Gover, who has reported on these cancellations, they are left with Walker, Kung Fu and Nancy Drew, each featuring one series regular LGBTQ character, and shows like The Flash and Superman and Lois with no queer series regulars at all. HBO Max. HBO Max is another big name in queer inclusive content, boasting shows like Euphoria, It's a Sin, The Other Two, Gentleman Jack and most recently Our Flag Means Death. Or should I say it was. Last month, news broke that the channel would be shut down by Warner Brothers, merging with Discovery Plus, leaving the future of many of its shows, particularly its original content, up in the air. With these background deals, mergers and cuts, we can see a bigger pattern emerging. Wait, is every show getting cancelled? So yeah, as it turns out, it's not just the gay shows, it's basically all of the shows. The CW has cancelled over half of its scripted slate, HBO Max is cancelling 36 original series, and Netflix seems to cancel every show that isn't Stranger Things. These include some heavy hitters with seemingly large followings, but the noise made by a fandom online doesn't necessarily correlate with the show having a future in TV. So how do they decide what is worthy of keeping? Obviously, they want to keep the shows that are profitable and cancel the shows that are unprofitable. So all a show needs to do is bring in revenue that's higher than its production costs, right? Increasing production costs. Yeah, so there are some factors that cause production budgets to increase unexpectedly, like, for example, COVID. COVID restrictions increase the budget of several shows, making them less profitable despite maintaining their audiences. Netflix spokesperson, for example, cited the pandemic as the sole reasoning behind cancelling the hit show Glow, saying, We've made the difficult decision not to do a fourth season of Glow due to COVID, which makes shooting this physically intimate show with its large ensemble cast especially challenging. Netflix also cited COVID as a justification for cancelling the shows like The Society and I'm Not Okay With This. According to EW, while Netflix executives were pleased with the performance of both shows, the uncertainty around production dates, balancing the needs and availability of a large cast, in the case of The Society, and unexpected budget increases due to the pandemic contributed to the decisions. Shows with other networks and streamers that previously had renewals like Drunk History and On Becoming a God in Central Florida 
also saw these promised new seasons revoked due to COVID practicalities and budget cuts, even as more people than ever were joining streaming and TV package services during lockdowns. It should be noted that Netflix also has an internal policy that gives TV producers a pay increase with each season. As a result, a show's budget significantly increases from season one to season two to season three and so on. This policy further incentivizes cancellations if finances are the primary factor in renewals. Okay, so some shows are getting cancelled because their production costs decrease profit margins, but how do we even determine the revenue new for a TV show in the first place. On cable, renewing a season was almost entirely decided by viewership. The bigger the audience, the more a network could charge advertisers, the more money that they could bring in. But with streaming services like Netflix that don't rely on advertisers, determining revenue is much more complicated and confusing, even for the people who work for them. Rachel Shuker, the creator of The Babysitter's Club, was shocked when her show was cancelled, telling Vulture, I don't know what they wanted that they didn't get. Our numbers seem fine. It was pretty close to what we did last season. I feel like Netflix's internal metrics can change month to month. Something that was fine three months ago is suddenly not what they need. So at some point, despite the Babysitter's Club production costs and audience numbers remaining relatively consistent, Netflix decided that the show was no longer pulling in enough revenue. But how did they calculate that revenue in the first place and why does Netflix keep changing its internal metrics? Bingeability. Netflix likes to measure completers, or viewers who watch the entirety of a show, particularly within 28 days of the show's release. In other words, it's no longer how many people watch a show, it's how quickly they watch a show. That's why so many shows, including First Kill, overly rely on unnecessary cliffhangers. The fate of the show depends on you clicking the next episode button. But completers aren't the only valuable audience metric. Streaming services also try and figure out which shows bring in new subscribers. New subscribers. Other than increasing their subscription costs, the only way for a streaming business to increase the overall revenue is by continually bringing in new audiences. As the Financial Times put it, the company's priority is adding and retaining subscribers, not selling advertising. A new show is probably a better way to find new subscribers than one that has already been around. All this breeds an ephemeral nature to the platform. The Netflix show can be popular for a few days or a week and then is quickly supplanted by the next release. Other streaming services like Prime Video and Hulu, both of which favour the more traditional cable-style weekly releases, probably have different audience metrics than Netflix. But like Netflix, they probably also share a strategy of finding new subscribers through new content. A prime example of a new subscriber show would be Game of Thrones. Lots of people subscribe to HBO exclusively for that show. And while they had their subscription, they might also decide to watch The Sopranos or The Newsroom, but Game of Thrones was the reason for their subscription. As a result, HBO HBO assigned Game of Thrones more value than any of its other shows and has invested tens of millions of dollars into its sequel. At this point in the video, I wanted to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, Fabulous. Maybe you're someone who struggles with sticking to a daily routine, especially while working from home, or you have a big goal or project to work towards, but you find it hard to motivate yourself. If that sounds familiar, this might be the app for you. I, as we have established on this channel before, am riddled with ADHD, so an app that's going to help me find a routine, remind me when I'm meant to be doing things and connect me with other people working on the same goals, it's a no-brainer. So you can use Fabulous in two different ways. Firstly, for tracking habits, you can set up science-backed daily rituals like a productive morning or relaxing nighttime routine. You can pick from over a hundred habits on the app or create your own for a completely personalized system that works for you. For example, I'm trying to disconnect from my work and read before I go to sleep, but you might want to add a reminder to take your meds, write in your journal, or wash up your dishes before you sleep. And then the second way you can use the app is by taking on challenges or journeys journeys designed specifically to help you achieve your goals, like developing a better sleep routine or improving your concentration and focus. These might involve deciding on one thing to do every day over like three, seven, even 30 days, like learning a new study skill or practicing gratitude or decluttering your space. Or you can take part in a dedicated journey over a number of weeks where Fabulous will guide you through the challenge with daily activities, letters filled with inspiring and motivating lessons, and access to message boards with other people completing the same challenge as you. You. I'm currently doing the concentration and focus journey and I think the best thing about it is how gentle the progress is. Logging three days of starting the day with a to-do list leads on to the bigger step of setting up a calendar system that works for me and so on. The focus is on small steps rather than a big overwhelming pressure to suddenly be like a perfectly organized and productive version of yourself overnight because that is not realistic 
or sustainable. With Fabulous Premium, you can build and improve an unlimited number of habits in your routines and take part in all the programs and exercises. So if you want to start building your ideal daily routine, the first 100 people who click on the link will get 25% off a Fabulous subscription. Discoverability. The main pull of streamers originally was the idea of an endless bank of content in one place, much more than your local video store or terrestrial channels could carry. But that model has its downsides. According to CNBC, streaming executives across the industry frequently talk of Netflix having a discovery problem. Netflix has so much content, they say, that it's hard to search for its best stuff. Or Netflix tries to mitigate this with algorithms and top 10 lists, the service has hundreds of shows that get lost in the shuffle because there's so much content Content gumming up the search process. Why pay for the illusion of a huge bank of content if half the stuff wasn't really being seen? By cutting shows, streamers seem to hope to move towards more of a curated model over a mass of shows and movies. Audience culling. This essentially follows on from the previous point, but many of these companies are now talking about their content being for a particular audience, most likely those that are bringing in new subscribers. This is pretty well demonstrated by the now infamous Warner Brothers earnings call slide that talks about how HBO Max is all about male viewers and fandoms, while women prefer genre -dom, whatever that is on Discovery. With this tight audience focus, they can decide that certain content outside of that is surplus to requirements. This also streamlines marketing and gives a more specific audience of subscribers to chase for acquisitions. With the merging of HBO Max and Discovery, for example, we have a lack of interest in children's content that once had a place on both of these individual channels. Active users might let their kids watch, but it wasn't why they signed up and paid their fee. This was evidenced by the fact that the iconic show Sesame Street was failing to pull in strong numbers while on HBO Max. Money. Are we surprised? Money is a factor, money makes the world go round and the TV producers happy. But the overarching flow of cash can be complicated, as I mentioned before. When Warner Brothers cancelled the upcoming Batgirl film seemingly out of nowhere, it seemed on the surface to be a ridiculous financial move. This movie, after all, was not only going to be culturally significant, with the inclusion of the first openly trans character and actress in the DC extended film universe, but also it was near finished, in the late post-production stages, apparently, and it reportedly cost a hundred million dollars to make. If you already spent all this money on making the movie, surely it would be like throwing it all away to then just not release it. At first, the story was that the movie wasn't testing well enough with audiences. Speculation went wild and the news fueled a ton of the classic get woke, go broke nonsense. How bad must it have been to have abandon the project right like serves them right for making that kind of movie well we live in a world of unscrupulous financial mischief and it turns out that there is a change of strategy merger tax benefit which allows warner brothers to write off incomplete projects ceo david zaslav known as a ruthless cost cutter and the warner brothers discovery merger allegedly gave an excuse to hedge their bets and save on marketing budget and the cost of a theatrical release after hbo max was shut down. It just made financial sense to not release the project. Wild. We've seen the same thing with many cancelled HBO Max shows where the initial production costs were deemed a worthwhile loss to ensure that they wouldn't have to pay residuals to cast, crew and writers for airing episodes and repeats. Allegedly, this is due to save them millions of dollars. And we're going to talk about the sort of human costs of this later, but I just want to point out that like saving millions of dollars like yeah we move this number over here we do all this paperwork good for us we've saved some dollars but like residuals are a huge part of the business they're a huge part of people's like ongoing income and the stability that these people can have between jobs that keep getting unexpectedly cancelled leading to more insecurity i just wanted to point that out now but we are going to be talking about it in a little bit more depth later. And this isn't the first time we've seen money saving moves at the potential expense of great content. The internet's favorite Adam Ruins Everything was canceled following AT&T's acquisition of Warner Media when AT&T made the decision to end scripted content on the network. When speaking about the cancellation, he emphasized the ruthless cost-cutting measure. 100 people were fired from True TV, including the head of the network, the vice head of the network, the entire programming department, the entire marketing department. Basically everyone in the entire building was let go. And then they started canceling shows to cut costs. 
If we're being cynical about it, we might say that the landscape of television right now is no longer aimed at making long-running and well-loved quality series, but is instead about which shows are bringing the most new subscribers for the cheapest possible budget, even with a stable viewership across seasons, which would have a show continue supernatural style for decades on traditional TV, streaming shows can be seen as failures if they don't hook new subscribers. Monopoly, more than just a board game. There seems to be a misconception around the reality of media monopolies. I've heard some people fantasize about like a Netflix monopoly because they're so tired of paying for multiple streaming services, but that's not necessarily the reality. Disney and Comcast own Hulu, but you'd still have to pay for both Disney Plus and Hulu if you want to see their full range of content. Monopolies are never good for the consumer. They don't prevent inconvenience, they often create it. Monopolies might create profit, but can absolutely harm the economy, decreasing competition, erasing jobs, and in the middle of media monopolies, limiting television. Earlier, I mentioned a show called Adam Ruins Everything, which ran for three seasons on True TV. At the time of its cancellation, Adam Ruins Everything was their second most popular show. It was a low cost, high revenue program that was basically the flagship show of True TV. Four years after its cancellation, Adam himself posted a video to Twitter explaining why the show, which was objectively successful, was canceled. True TV was owned by Warner Media, and in 2018, AT&T acquired or merged with Warner Media. It turns what used to be a thriving TV network into a graveyard that just airs Impractical Jokers reruns. The problem is, when two companies merge into one, there's less competition, and less competition means less jobs for us around, and less options for us in the media. So if you want to know what killed Adam Ruins Everything, Monopoly Capitalism did. That's the murderer. Over the course of the AT&T Warner merger, over 45,000 people lost their jobs. And we can expect those kinds of losses again with the Discovery Warner Brothers mergers because, oh right, uh, the AT&T Warner merger was a spectacular financial failure and now AT&T is selling Warner Media to Discovery. According to an article in Wired, WB is going to cut 70% of the production staff at HBO Max, effectively ending scripted HBO Max only content. These mergers further affect content by limiting the audiences of TV shows. The Warner Paramount merger resulted in Warner and CBS Studios being forced to break off their individual show deals with Netflix. Overnight, the now cancelled shows like Legend Charmed and Roswell lost a significant portion of their viewers. These mergers are a symptom of monopoly capitalism, competition decreasing as fewer and fewer companies gain more and more power, and under capitalism a lack of competition seems to result in higher prices and lower quality. The consequences for art. From its very beginnings, television has often been a negotiation between storytelling and profit. The traditional structure of TV shows was shaped around commercial breaks. After product placement and integration became a thing, writers had to figure out how to work commercials into dialogue itself. The advent of streaming forever changed not just how we watch television, but what kind of TV we watched. Serialization began to dominate over episodic storytelling. Cliffhanger endings became a must. If monopoly capitalism is creating an increase in premature cancellations, how will that shape the content that we do get to watch? Think about all of the well-loved TV shows that had uneven, mediocre, or even just straight up terrible first seasons. New Girl, Parks and Rec, and The Simpsons took multiple seasons to find the tone and characterization of their protagonists. The first season of Breaking Bad was struggling with pacing, the first seasons of Buffy and Angel lacked consistency, and the first season of It's Always Sunny doesn't even have Danny DeVito in it. Amazing TV shows don't always have the perfect star. As Dan Levy once tweeted, TV shows need time and space to lay foundation, to develop and to grow. In the wrong hands, Shit's Creek would have been yanked off the air in season one for underperforming. Right now, we have a lot of promising shows that will never get to fulfill those promises. As audiences, we can feel the absence of that art, the collapse of that potential, and it's breaking down the trust between audiences and TV shows. It's getting harder and harder for many people to summon the enthusiasm for new shows that they feel are probably gonna get canceled anyway. It's a spiral, right? Like the more I invest in shows that get canceled, the more disheartened I get, and the less likely I am to invest in a new show, thinking it'll probably get canceled, which means ironically that it's more likely to get cancelled, which means I'm more disheartened and so on. This kind of system further damages art by preventing artists from developing stable careers. Contrary to popular belief, a lack of stability does not result in better art. 
If TV show writers, actors, producers and directors are constantly scrambling to find new work because shows keep getting cancelled, how are they supposed to build a career, develop their craft? It's not that there won't be shows with long runs, but it feels like said shows need to achieve like a Game of Thrones or Stranger Things level of success. They need to be mainstream. So what if you're outside of the mainstream as a creator or as an audience member? Oops, it was homophobia the whole time. We've come full circle back to the beginning of the video, everyone. According to CNBC, HBO Max and Discovery are removing series that don't resonate with large audiences. Decisions like this, where only those shows that speak to everyone are deemed worthy, are inevitably going to risk sidelining marginalized voices. And it isn't just queer voices, right? It's black, Asian, disabled, Muslim, autistic voices, and especially the voices of those that live at a combination of these kind of identities. The relatable protagonist in our media has pretty much always been assumed to be a white, straight, cis man. Marginalized audiences are used to having to relate to this kind of character in TV and film, and yet the same is not necessarily expected in the reverse. Many parents are still more likely to take their daughter to see a superhero movie than they are to take their son to see a Barbie one. Associate media studies and production professor Adrienne Shaw has noted, there's a certain amount of cultural cachet in representing marginalized groups, but historically every media distribution platform, production company or distribution hub at a certain point decides that if they have enough of another audience, the marginalized audience is the first to go. Money, monopoly and mergers. They might all be the top line reason for cancellations, but at the heart of it, we have to ask if that final decision is still influenced by this kind of bias, even unconsciously. Journalist Danielle Scott pointed out in a recent article on queer TV cancellations. It's all well and good applauding the streamers for making these shows, but it means very little if they just as quickly cancel them. And when we look behind the scenes at the production of these kind of shows, we can see the homophobic cracks around even those that are greenlit. The now iconic miniseries It's a Sin, created by national treasure Russell T. Davis, is a classic example of this. RTD, as he's affectionately known, is as close to a sure thing as you can get in UK TV. He pioneered unashamed queerness on TV with Queer as Folk, he was the showrunner for the new era of Doctor Who, and created the stunning and ambitious series Years and Years, to name just a few. Any new show idea of his should immediately have been snapped up without delay. And yet, when he approached producers and broadcasters in the UK, hoping to make an eight episode series about the AIDS epidemic in Britain, all of them turned him down. It took literally years for him to get Channel 4 to agree to the show. And even then, they only decided to commission four episodes with his team eventually persuading them to go up to a measly five. And it turns out that those five episodes were only possible because Lee Mason, commissioning editor of drama at Channel 4, literally put the script in his drawer and waited for all of the staff to change and all the heads of department to move on and then got the script out again and said, would you like to make this? multiple people in decision-making positions and all of the UK broadcasters decided that a queer show about the AIDS crisis wouldn't be popular enough, universal enough, safe enough for them to commission, even a handful of episodes of. Even one pitched by one of the most celebrated British writers and showrunners of the last few decades. RTD, while proud of the show, is still disappointed with the circumstances around it. I still mourn the eight-part version. I'm sad that never got made. That hurts. I did have to cut things out. And how did the show do in reality? While the series gained all four Channel 4 streaming service its highest monthly figures to date for January, nearly doubling the previous figure. The series became the third biggest on the platform and the most binged new series ever, with the first episode becoming the platform's bigger drama launch on record. I guess we'll have to see if that's finally good enough for RTD to not have to spend years pitching his new show to only be offered four episodes in the future. And it's not just the pre-production that can be mired with biases. The marketing of queer media has also come up against criticism. Pace magazine noticed the differences in series even on the same network. Ahead of the premiere of Superman and Lois in February of last year, fans noticed ads for the show popping up everywhere, including pizza boxes in select cities. In contrast, when Ava DuVernay's freshman superhero drama Naomi's premiere rolled around this past January, there was no special two-hour premiere and there was certainly no pizza box. Another show by an absolutely iconic 
TV showrunner that has like queer and black leads and it's a superhero show. And like, I didn't hear about it until I started researching this video. You can tell when marketing has failed when when that is, when that's the situation. In a landscape of bloated streaming services, marketing is key to a show's success, specifically marketing that would lead to those all important viewing and completion figures as early as possible. It's not enough to be a show that gets discovered weeks or months after its initial release. You need people to watch it all and watch it now. First Kill has garnered comment on the ways in which marketing, even if it's done at all, can still negatively impact a show. The series showrunner has said in a recent interview, I so enthusiastically signed on to this show because it has something for everyone. Strong women leads, supernatural intrigue, an epic Shakespearean battle between warring families and a prominently featured black family in the genre space, something black viewers crave and a general audience needs to be treated to. The art for the initial marketing was beautiful. I think I expected that to be the beginning and that the other equally compelling and important elements of the show, Monsters v Monster Hunters, the battle between the two powerful matriarchs, etc., would eventually be promoted and that didn't happen. By positioning it as a titillating show, Twilight for people who wanted to watch lesbians make out, many viewers saw Netflix as interested in sensationalism rather than gaining a dedicated fan base for the show. In fact, some fans are convinced that the show was doomed from the start, telling journalists, the consensus we've come to is that this was not a show Netflix had any intention to renew. This isn't just about a sapphic show being canceled. This is a larger question that needs to be had about how black folks, especially queer black folks and their stories, their visions, their voices are thrown out constantly. We don't matter in these spaces. The official line on such accusations across the media landscape is of course, that it isn't the case. The CW CEO stated at their 2022 upfronts, content was never a factor in the cancellation of any of their shows. Yet others have pointed out that sapphic shows like I'm Not Okay With This have been canceled supposedly due to COVID, while productions like Sweet Tooth, which required international travel for filming in the middle of a pandemic, seem to have been released without the same issues. Leading many to question, when the going gets tough, who are the first to be dropped? We're seeing a general trend upwards in terms of the number of LGBTQ plus characters on TV. However, when we look closer at these figures and the wave of cancellations that seem to be part of the media landscape for the foreseeable future, a more bleak image emerges. Statistics around the array of trans women of color on screen increasing in leaps and bounds is great, until Pose gets canceled and suddenly that number plummets with nothing to take its place. There's the danger that the increase in representation we're seeing might fall by the wayside if we don't look at the overall picture, graciously allowing queer-led shows to try the ratings game, ready to cancel them without warning, allowing them to fly under the radar, it's not necessarily the recipe for healthy, vibrant and lasting representation across the industry. As Raina Deerwater, entertainment research and analysis manager at GLAAD has said, it's no longer just enough to make a show, they have to fully promote it, advertise it and stand behind it especially shows telling new and diverse stories, which seemingly have such a weight stacked against them from the commissioning process onwards. Ultimately, we need to shift from allowing queer representation to protecting it, because only then can broadcasters and streamers say with any authenticity or truth that they are actually supporting us. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any thoughts, please leave them in the comments below. I don't have a TV show, uh, but I do have a sapphic book. So check that out. I'll leave the link in the description along with my Patreon if you want to support me making videos like this one and all of my social media. So you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye.